thanks for that, Mark. That was uh, <laughs> one of the best introductions I've ever had, actually, funnily enough, which says a lot more about me, I think, than Mark. Um, now, I've brought my own laptop here, so if this doesn't work, just shout out if slides don't move when I'm talking about them. Uh, I want to thank these guys here for, for having me. As Louis said, um, they're, they're good people. They really are, and they're smart people, and you know, we've become uh, close over the last few years, and I'm continually impressed by the job they do, the thought process that goes into, into what they do. And it's, as I say, it's a privilege to work with these guys. They, they really are some of the best out there. Having said that, I'm now going to hopefully not bring you down too much. They told me not to be too miserable about this stuff. I, I get this reputation for being a pessimist, which is, which is not true. I'm an eternal optimist, but I like to think I'm more of a realist. And they only gave me 15 minutes, and Mark's going to give me the hook if I go over. So we'll get this thing started and see how we go. Does this work? Here we go. Okay, so as we entered last year, there were a whole bunch of things that could have derailed the world, and everyone was talking about them. We spoke about them here last year. Um, but in the end, all that seemed to matter was how much money was printed, or as Dave said, created by the Fed. And perhaps more importantly, the, the amount of confidence that the world had that A, they would continue down that road, and B, potentially expand it if things got worse. At the, at the, as the end of the year came around and the dust had settled, you know, equities had banner years. Uh, right across the world, um, and it wasn't just equities, you know, asset prices, everything from, uh, from art to wine to real estate in all kinds of funky places, uh, and even a tuna fish, uh, all outstripped previous record bids. At the year end, all the reviews in the mainstream media were talking about the stellar performance of equities and the resurgence of the US housing market, and they were the, they were the two big stories. Um, beneath the stories of those, it's a slightly different story. At least some of the things that are going on underneath need to be understood before you make investment decisions in 2014. So I'm going to run through just a few of them um, and see if we can work out where it all went right. <clears throat> now, the inspiration for this uh, little presentation came to me from, from this guy here. This is a guy called George Best. Now, talking about football, and it is called football, folks, just so we're clear on that, uh, in America is a dangerous thing to do. But this gentleman, if you don't know who he is, shame on you. This is George Best arguably the finest football player who ever lived. Um, <clears throat> but Best had a somewhat checkered uh, personal life. And the charge laid against him was that this was an incredibly mercurial, talented guy who basically took that talent, threw it away, and ended up, instead of a legend, as something of a hard luck story. And the reason for this was that along with that prodigious talent that he had, he had uh, an insatiable appetite for women and booze and horses and women and booze and women. Uh, in fact, Best actually is the only man I know who dated three, count them, three Miss Worlds. And <clears throat> the inspiration for this presentation involves a story that he told himself on a speaking tour a number of years ago uh, with a woman called Mary Staven, who at the time um, Best was dating, and they had an on-off relationship for a few years, was, was the current Miss World. And the story goes like this. Best uh, and Staven had been out in London for dinner, and they went to a casino uh, where Best won 25,000 pounds, which back in the 70s was a lot of money. Um, uh, in a casino, and so he took the cash with him, went back to their suite at the Savoy, Best picks up the phone, calls room service, and orders a bottle of champagne, the finest Dom Perignon, and two glasses. And about 15 minutes later, a little Irish bellboy comes up to the room, knocks on the door. The door's opened by Best, stripped to the waist, and he starts to sign the, uh, sign the chit. And as he's signing it, the little bellboy looks over George's shoulder, and on the bed behind him, he sees Miss World in her underwear and 25,000 pounds in cash spread all over the bed. And George Best thanks him, leaves a generous tip, and as he's closing the door, the little Irish bellboy puts his foot in the door, and he looks him in the eye, and he says, tell me, George, where did it all go wrong? <laughs> and and that, story was, that story was the inspiration for this story. However, despite all this uh, larrikin behavior Best had, was capable of moments of great poignancy. And one of the most famous things he ever said was that when he was gone, people will forget all the rubbish, and all that will be remembered was his skill at football, which obviously was completely wrong, because I've just told you a story about all the other <laughs> stuff that went on. But he was a hell of a footballer. If we look at economies across the globe in the last couple of years, I think it's also important to strip away this veneer and try and understand what's going on beneath the surface. So I'm going to look at a few things that went on last year, and hopefully they'll give us some pointers going into the next year. Now, Dave's uh, talked about this already. Um, this is perhaps, I think, arguably the most important chart in the world that people need to understand. And this is uh, the expansion of credit, if it comes in, here we go, uh, the expansion of credit uh, in the United States versus GDP in the same country from uh, the 1920s through World War II to the present day. 
There's a couple of very important things that this chart demonstrates. The first is the fact that the vast majority of the growth through that 20th century and into the 21st was, in fact, credit expansion, as uh, the two guys before me have already touched on, and it wasn't GDP growth. The second is the relative size, as you can see there, of the global financial crisis that took place in 2008. As you can see, those events, which uh, I'm sure we all remember almost, quote, unquote, collapsed the system, whatever the hell that means, were, in the grand scheme of things, relatively small. Not only that, but in order to stabilize that meltdown, uh, the expansion of credit had, and I mean had to, not just stabilize, but continue growing fast, and that's, what, that's what's happened. The curve of GDP growth, as you can see here, is actually consistent and reasonably shallow, uh, but the growth in credit re required to maintain that shallow growth in GDP was becoming ever more parabolic in trajectory, and we, I think we all know in this room what happens when things go parabolic. They're not what they seem. Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cough. <clears throat> so we're going to dig a little deeper into the reality behind the numbers that are being touted around the world as a recovery. And we'll begin, of, uh, of course, with the economy itself. Now, the past year, the Fed tied itself and its stimulus programs rather foolishly, I thought, to the unemployment rate. Um, uh, they were forced very quickly to backtrack that, and now they've scrapped it all together. Um, because it tumbled far faster than they'd actually anticipated it would when they made that, uh, when they made that explicit link. And the reason for that is this chart here. Um, Dave touched upon it again. This is the labor force participation rate. And what this shows us is that uh, people have been falling out of the workforce at a record pace. Once you're classified as not looking for employment in the uh, United States, you're taken out of this, this number, uh, you're taken out of the workforce uh, and, and, you're, and you're not included in what's called the U3 unemployment rate, which is the headline rate that we all read in, in the newspapers. And as you take more and more people out of the workplace, obviously you bring down this unemployment rate. And that's why this has fallen so fast. It's not people finding jobs, it's people stop looking for work. Um, uh, there's a couple of other unemployment facts I've written, written down here that I was reading today. Uh, there are currently 1.1 fewer Americans today working than there were in November 2006. And during that time, the population has grown by 16 million people. So as you can see, that's a problem that's going to keep manifesting itself going forward. The number of working age Americans without a job has increased by 27 million since the year 2000. And Dave said there's uh, about 90 odd million able-bodied workers not in the workforce. And in November 2000, uh, there were 64.3% of all working age Americans had a job. When uh, Barack Obama first took office in 2008, that had fallen from 64.3% to 60.6%. That's a huge drop. And from there, it's fallen another 2% to 58.6%. So the unemployment picture is actually pretty ugly here in the US, despite optically looking better because the headline number's coming down. And I think more and more people are starting to understand that to, you know, a falling unemployment rate doesn't necessarily mean everything's OK. But what does that mean for GDP? Well, as you can see, hopefully this next chart's going to come in here. We're in the middle of the weakest decade for growth uh, in over two centuries. Uh, now, the decade is, I will admit, just a third of the way through. But even if we're going to try and reach that average there line, which is a 200 plus year average, we're going to need an explosion in growth in the US, the like of which we've never seen before. And I just can't see that happening. Uh, we've seen a recent slate of tepid at best numbers in the economy, most of which have been blamed on the poor weather in the East, um, which have led to seemingly constant lower and lower revisions of GDP over the last 12 months. Now, through, uh, through that time, however, corporates have performed uh, absolute miracles in squeezing the last drop of juice out of the lemons they've been handed. I mean, to an extraordinary degree, and again, this is something Dave touched upon. If you look at this anemic GDP growth and the success at cutting costs and generating admirable profits has led to that uh, percentage of GDP that is corporate profits reaching uh, an all-time high. Uh, it's extremely elevated. Um, and this happened, unfortunately, against the backdrop of declining employee compensation, as you can see in that, in that blue chart there. And this is, of course, completely unsustainable, particularly an economy that's so reliant upon consumption for its growth. Um, it, as I said, completely unsustainable. Now, corporate profit margins, as Dave said, have a habit of being very volatile, but very cyclical, and they always revert to the mean. So if you take that chart, the red line there, and you picture a 70% reversion to the mean uh, and the inevitable overshoot, as you can see, it's, it's not pretty. It's definitely a time to hunker down and look for safe places to be. As I mentioned a while ago, through 2013, we saw almost continuous uh, lower and lower revisions in consensus GDP. And these two charts speak to that. As you'll see, the blue line there uh, is the consensus GDP for the US through the year. And the red line is uh, the MSCI 
World Index, which I think one of the guys showed before, which is a, basically a global benchmark of equities. So despite, um, as I said, uh, almost a 45 degree revision downwards in expectations for US growth, the stock market went up and up and up around the world, and that's never happened before. It's great for 2013, obviously, but potentially not so great for 2014, unless we can find some organic growth from somewhere. Equities. Last year was a banner year, up 34% for the S&P. Uh, Venezuela was up 480%. If anyone was lucky enough to be longer than that and had their currency hedged, they would have had a hell of a year. Um, but if we look at them, uh, this, this chart, does that not work? Here we go. Here we go. This, this chart, um, for me, is incredibly illustrative, and it shows the flows of equity investing into ETFs and out of uh, managed mutual funds. Now, the advantages of ETFs are, are pretty obvious. They're, they're much lower cost, um, and QE has meant that people want to be long equities. They don't really care what that means. They don't want to do the work. They don't want to do the research and look for individual stocks. They just want to be long stuff because it's going up, and that's what's been touted. And look, that's what's happened. It's great. It's essentially meant the dumbing down of investing. Now, on the way up, this has been fine, because as things go up, there's always someone that will pay a higher price for something until there isn't. But on the way down, this increases volatility enormously, particularly with the amount of computer-driven trading that we're seeing uh, on the exchanges now. Something like 70% of the uh, volume that trades on the New York Stock Exchange now is driven by computers. Um, when this trend reverses, and, and it will at some point, you can guarantee that, there really aren't any real buyers left, not at these levels. They're much, much lower down. Uh, and they're the smart money that Dave spoke about earlier on, waiting to look for value investments. And you're not going to find value at these levels. Now, I've spoken about the effect of QE on equities. And this next chart um, demonstrates that. I hope it's going to work. Here we go. Beyond any doubt. Uh, here we go. Now, th this is the same chart that Dave had, but I wanted to talk about a couple of things around it. So the blue line there is the S&P, and the red line is the Fed's balance sheet. And Dave showed this correlation earlier on. But those, those, uh, those rectangles there are very, very important. If you look at the first one, it, this shows you when QE1 first came in. You can see when they took that first giant leap in the, uh, in the Fed's balance sheet, the equity market continued to fall uh, until we got capitulation at the bottom and all the panic selling was done. Once that happened, the market got the joke. And you can see there that, um, that the S&P started to rise pretty aggressively. Now the next... Uh, the next rectangle you'll see there, if you look at the Fed's balance sheet, you'll see it starts to contract. And you'll see that the equity market, as soon as they took away the stimulus, fell pretty hard. Uh, then the market got the whiff that two th uh, QE2 was coming in, and you can see there the market jumped considerably just before the Fed's balance sheet began to do the same. Again, sideways movement, Fed balance sheet, large correction in the market. What you'll see after the four uh, rectangles finish is QE4. And that was a whole different beast altogether. And, that, and they, they realized that Without giving the market consistency, uh, you're always going to have these large rises and large falls. So we have a whole different chart there. And you can see it's going up at a very nice steady angle. Everybody knew that $85 billion a month was coming into the markets, and they could plan accordingly. And that made things much easier. Now they're starting to take that away, and I'll come to the taper in a second. Um, things could start to get a little bit squirrely again. If we move on to the next chart, all this sound and fury, and we want to see what that signifies, well, in the end, it actually doesn't signify anything. You can see here, this is the S&P 500 deflated by the amount of QE pumped into the system. And as you can see, what the QE has done has basically stopped the market falling any further. It's gone sideways for the last five years uh, in, de in deflated terms. That's not much to show for a few trillion dollars of uh, extra money. Now, another way to look at the effect of QE is with this, this next chart. Now, this is QE going back to the dying days of 2008. And you can see how strong the market has been since it, uh, since it bottomed in March 2009. But if we overlay the various QE programs here, that comes through, you'll see a different story. Now, I won't go into the color coding. Um, you probably can't read it from the back there. I apologize for that. But basically, what you're going to see is the QE periods have accounted for a 95% rally in the stock market, which is great until you realize that the stock market only actually went up 80% during that time. And that's going to be a problem as the taper continues. Now, interestingly enough, we have been here before, and, and this chart is uh, it's, it's really just for a bit of fun, so don't panic or anything. Uh, this is the Dow Jones from June 2013 to January this year, as you can see, very, very strong. And this is the Dow Jones between January 1928 and January 1930, just before the Great Depression. Now, charts like this are 
I have to say, they're great for shock value, they're great for getting people think, and they're great for getting a point across. And you can, they're scary as hell at face value. You can, there are all kinds of arguments you, you can make about this. The point of me showing this chart is just to demonstrate how quickly can, things can change, and once they do change, how far they can go in the opposite direction. And, and these are the things that, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but people need to be prepared for. You know, Dave's talking about hunkering down, and this is exactly what people need to do at this time, is to hunker down and wait for this to actually start, to demonstrate real reasons to buy things again. Either way, these markets, believe me, are no place for enthusiastic amateur investors. Now, I'll throw in one quick chart of the taper here. Uh, it's one of my favorites, and it puts the, the, the taper in perspective. Now, there's two possible newspaper headlines surrounding the taper. This is one of them, fed to taper 10 billion per month. You'll see poor Janet looking very glum there. The other way of actually reporting the same story would be this one, fed to spend 65 billion per month indefinitely. And obviously, Janet looking a lot happier about life there. Now, obviously, the former story was the one blanketing the media, but the latter is actually a much better representation of reality. Either way, as you can see from this chart, in the long run, it doesn't mean very much. If I bring this up. So the red, the red line here is the uh, original $85 billion a month QE program. Uh, this next one coming in here, the blue one, that's with a $10 billion taper. That's the first taper going out to 2015. This one coming in now, the yellow one, that's the taper as it stands at the moment. And let's, let's assume they taper another 10 billion at the next Fed meeting. That's what the Fed's balance sheet will look like at the end of that. So as you can see, at the end of 2015, we're still gonna be way over $4 trillion on the Fed's balance sheet against a $1 trillion balance sheet just before the crisis hit, or just, yeah, just before the crisis hit. So you can see the taper, there's been a lot of uh, sound and fury about it, but it really doesn't mean an awful lot in practical terms. What's really going to affect markets is the belief in the intention of the Fed, and that's going to that's play out over the next few months. I can see Mark out the corner of my eye, giving me the evil eye, but there's one more slide I wanted to show you on Europe. This could very well be the stupidest person on the face of the earth. Not me, that's European politicians that was saying that, just in case you're wondering. Um, now, Europe somehow, I, I, I don't know how, they got through the year uh, unscathed last year, remarkably well, despite a downgrade in France, you know, more trouble in Greece, more trouble in Cy Cyprus, and even riots in Sweden of all places, for God's sake. I mean, I didn't think that would happen. And everywhere you look, you hear the leaders in Europe hailing this miraculous recovery. Um, what they actually meant by that was, you know, rejoice, Europe didn't explode into a million pieces. Um, that's a big difference. Now, if you look at this chart, this, I think, is possibly the most important chart around Europe uh, that anyone needs to look at, certainly for the first half of this year. And this is the change in approval amongst the various EU countries uh, in the leadership of the European Union. Now, in May uh, of this year, May 22nd to 25th, every European country, or every member of the EU, I beg your pardon, has to have elections to, uh, to represent uh, the countries in the European Parliament. And as you can see here, uh, with the exception of Germany, uh, everybody's approval ratings of the EU are on a downward path. Now, I've left out countries like Latvia and Romania and Bulgaria for obvious reasons. I mean, the bloom is very much still on the rose. They've only just come into this little project, and it's certainly better than what they had before. But every established European country um, is dissatisfied with the way that Europe is being run. And the problem you have there is that the parties across the continent who are making uh, huge inroads in terms of the voting public, um, and it's true, in, it's true in Greece, it's true in Italy, and it's true in uh, Louis' home country of France, are extreme parties, either right wing, left wing. The common unifying uh, platform that they have is anti-EU and anti-Euro. And if these parties do actually take significant uh, percentages of the vote and, and gain a lot of seats in Parliament, it's just going to make the whole process, which already is basically unworkable, impossible. Uh, you can't govern Europe with, uh, with a significant uh, portion of your elected representatives anti the project and anti the euro. So when those, when those elections come around, um, people really need to pay attention to them because uh, far right or far left is not really as important as the fact that these, these countries are all uh, anti-EU. Now, uh, they told me to make sure you finish on a high note and keep people... Happy. So, uh, this last slide here is uh, <coughs> is a cat and a dog that uh, I thought you could all just take home with you. Very cute. Um, and and that's it for me. Thank you.